On this video, I'm going to give you my full review of Tang Garden from Thundergriff Games. It's a big box, it's a pretty box, but as you know, we can't always judge board games by the covers. So whether it's good or not, that remains to be seen. Let's go into some detail, and I'll tell you more. Hi everyone, I'm Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple and if you like what you see, please don't forget to click the subscribe button in that little watermark in the corner and click the bell to find out more about future video content. Of course, everything I talk about in this video will also be provided as links in the description below. I'm taking a look at Tang Garden from Thundergriff Games which has also been distributed by Lucky Duck Games. This new game has been on Kickstarter and has recently just hit retail release for an asking price of £50 in the UK market. Set within the Tang Dynasty within China, players are building this communal garden while seeking to balance the effects of nature within it. Players will build the garden using tiles very much in a Carcassonne style fashion where they will attempt to match the different sides of terrain as they place the tiles on the board. Alternatively, they will seek to place decorations within the garden such as flowers, birds, trees, bridges and so on in order to score points via a method of set collection. On top of this, players have access to a special ability on their starting character but can influence more characters during the game not only to swap their ability for another one but perhaps to place the character inside the garden facing a specific direction and scoring points based on what they see within their line of sight. By building the garden, players are seeking to advance on three separate tracks within their player board, representing the three elements of nature, be it the watery, the greenery, and mountainous terrain. By advancing on these tracks, they gain access to be able to influence new characters during the game, but also intend to mop up these landscape token tiles on the board so that they can place these little landscape set pieces around the edge of the board, which are effectively standees with really gorgeous artwork on them, but also contain iconography, which may help them get points later. The decorations themselves are either little tokens or actual really nice looking set pieces on the board from pavilions to birds etc where by placing these decorations and holding onto the cards players are seeking to score points by a method of set collection depending on the type of decoration. For example birds and fish want to be done in pairs, pavilions want you to have the most pavilions in the game etc etc and things like that. In the case of characters you have the choice of either having a special ability or a line of sight bonus. Keeping a character for its special ability will, of course, give you some really cool power that might speed you throughout the game. But to use the character by placing it inside the garden on specified locations allows you to score points at the end of the game based on a criteria for what the character is facing. And this can be based on not only just playing decorations in the garden, but it could be on specific garden tiles, such as looking at different lakes, or it could even be based on those landscape tiles that you've been placing around the edge of the board by looking for specific icons, like for example, the village icon surrounded in green. Once the last landscape token is mopped up off the board, players then start to score up, and of course, whoever has the most points is the winner. Of course! So now we must go into detail and we start with D for duration. This is where I talk about, well, obviously, the length of the game and whether it outstays its welcome. In this case, the box is a little bit misleading, I have to say, because you have to deal with the fact that this says 45 minutes on the box. No leeway, just 45 minutes. However, that's very misleading because I guarantee you, you will not finish a four player game of this in 45 minutes. 45 minutes is more accurate for, in terms of setup and playing for solo mode. More on that a bit later. But this really should have been a 45 to 90 minute game. That would have been far more accurate because you're talking 45 minutes for a solo play if you're very quick 45 minutes for a two player but chances are you're looking at 60 minutes and then adding another 15 minutes per player on top of that so all in all i see most four player games of this going to 90 minutes and i still feel that i don't get why the box did not say 45 to 90 minutes it's making the game sound a lot shorter than it actually is and when you factor in the idea that pairs will have analysis paralysis at times during this game because it is more of a tactical affair and the amount of setup and takedown required you cannot imagine this game taking less than an hour with a full count of players which is probably going to be the most common way this gets played 
Moving on to E for ease of play, where I talk about how approachable the game is, how easy it is to grasp the rules and just get going. This one is pretty good for the most part. The rules for Tank Garden are pretty straightforward, and the rule book is very large and very well illustrated with good pictorial representations. However, there are one or two paragraphs I found in here which I found a little bit ambiguous in their wording. This is not a perfect rule book, but I certainly wouldn't go to say it was fundamentally bad either. I think it's just kind of trying to explain what should be fairly simple rules in a long-winded affair. But what really is a bit of a problem here is that the only reference aid you have in this game is the back of the book which talks about the characters. However, what about the rest of the game? Because on your turn sequence, let's put it this way, you have a choice of doing two major actions. Let's ignore the optional actions, let's just do the major ones. You have a choice of placing the garden tile or placing the decoration, okay? There's your two things. To place a garden tile, you place the garden tile off one of the stacks, fine, that's easy. But you get an advancement on your board for connecting a terrain type. You get another advancement for completing an enclosed section of terrain. If you connect a footpath, you get a coin. If you connect two footpaths, you get to pick either two coins or you get to advance anything on your board. How many different iterations of your turn did I just go through in the last few seconds there? And there's no reference guide to remind anybody of this. I don't get what it is with publishers and just being negligent or lazy or just don't feel it's necessary to put in a reference aid because this game really needs one. Gamers who are not being gamers for very long, the new player, like someone who's, a, you know, if you're trying to use this as a gateway game, I don't recommend it, but still, why? Why no reference aid? It really should have been there. Otherwise though, generally, the rules are pretty easy to grasp, whether it's solo or multiplayer, and you should be up and running within a reasonable amount of time. So now we go on to T for tactics and strategy, and here Tang Garden does really well. Because the game may feel like a charming zen-like experience, but there's a reasonable amount of thinking you've got to do here, and some meaningful choices. You have four stacks that you can pick the tiles from, although some of them might be flipped over. But if they are flipped over, it gives you more incentive to take decorations because you get to look at more cards. If you don't find something that's legal, then well, tough. So do you do it when you've got less choice or do you do it when you've got more choice? Same goes for the tiles. Do you take a tile when you've got more choice or when you've got less choice? And even then, once you take the tile, you've got the whole garden to build up. So where is it going to go? Where is it going to get you the most points? Do you want coins? Do you want advancement? Is there a particular terrain you're looking for? There's all these things you've got to consider, and that's on top of your character advancement and these lantern tokens which give you like a one-off special ability every now and again that you can refresh during the game if you're fortunate. The garden buildup is very dynamic, which means that not only does it build up completely differently each game, allowing for different play styles, but also the opportunities for scoring reveal themselves more as the game progresses, allowing for some element of catch up. You may feel like you're trailing behind, but there's no score track in this game, so the only way that you are tracking score by any player is how many coins they have in front of them. But that's only about a third of the scoring in this game. You've also got characters and decoration and all that stuff to come later. So it's not easy to necessarily gauge who's in the lead, but even then, you may get an opportunity later to place a character in a garden in such a way that it scores you a bajillion points, and the other players may not have seen it coming, the character might have come out at a late stage, or maybe the garden is built up in such a way that there's so many decorations on a single line that you nab that opportunity by grabbing a character, sticking the guy down, facing them north and saying, there's at least six or seven points there and I haven't even considered Considered the character ability yet. Those sort of opportunities reward players playing all sorts of different styles and at different playing levels. There is also a decent amount of variety in how you score during the game. If you connect up a bunch of footpaths on those tiles, you will get coins which are effectively points. But then also you might think, well okay, what if I just level up all these tracks on my board and get lots of different characters that could go on the board? There's a good way of scoring points depending on how the garden is set up. You may decide, you know what, I don't really care about the characters, let's just level up one or two tracks on my board really fast to the end. There's a potential 21 points, per track that you could earn from doing this. And you've got the decoration cards themselves, allowing for different avenues of set collections such as grabbing pears, grabbing different trees, grabbing the most pavilions, putting bridges in specified locations, and some of these decorations provide more opportunities for characters to be placed. And then of course you've got the characters themselves. Are they just looking down the line just to see a bunch of decorations? Have you built the garden in such a way that you've put all the water in one line and this character likes looking at water? 
or maybe you've spotted that around the outside of the board where those icons are on those landscape tiles that are standing up, you realize that character is really good if it's staring east because there's a lot of icons that they want to look for on that tile. Lots of different ways to score, not an easy way to gauge who the leader is, it allows for a decent sense of tactics and strategy within the game, probably more so on the former. Now we reach A for aesthetics. This is where I talk about the general look of the game, the artwork and the graphic design. This is very much a swings and roundabouts here because unfortunately, as much as the art is gorgeous and the, the art is gorgeous, the artist Matthew Muzak, I think it's called, you know, has done a great job here making this look beautiful. Those landscape tiles you put around the edge, they've got lovely pictorial representations on, particularly the water artwork. You know, there's a lot of good looking stuff here. And then on top of that, you've got the components themselves, which range from little nicely colored thick tokens all the way up to these pavilion standees that you can stick on the board made out of plastic and trees that are in kind of like, shall we say, double ply cardboard, a bit like the trees in photosynthesis if you've played that game. It looks great on the board. However, with good art comes a cost. And with the cost comes graphic design. The graphic design choices in this game are questionable to say the least. There is already a lot of iconography in this game and not having a reference aid doesn't help with that at all. But on top of that, some choices here just don't make sense. Firstly, the icons on those landscape tiles that I mentioned go around the edge, they are ridiculously small. We are talking incredibly tiny and you are unable to decipher what picture is what on those icons. The village one, whatever, it might as well just be a blur, a black dot compared to say the deer picture. At a distance, you are not going to be able to make them out. So what does the what did the publishers in that do? They put little colored circles around these icons so it's a little easier to spot. Yes and no. At a distance, it's still not that easy to make them out. They are still too small for the tiles. But on top of that, the colors that they use correspond to the characters. The characters have a big ring on the back of them to denote the color, but those colors are really similar. I believe there's something like yellow, dark yellow and gold. And then I believe there's gray, middle gray and darker gray. The colors and whatever they are, it's not even a black. It's a gray and darker gray. Why couldn't you have put a black in there? Wouldn't that have been more distinct? So you're trying to spot these icons, but you can't make out which color is for what character on the board because you're looking at two characters, one in front of you and one on the opponent and not realizing, oh, wait a minute. So hang on, I've got the yellow one and you've got the darker yellow one. Okay, and oh my God. God, that those landscape tiles require you to start squinting a lot at the other end of the table. And this is coming from someone who had LASIK laser eye surgery. If I'm saying it's difficult to make them out, they're difficult to make out. And I've played with a lot of players who have worse eyesight than me by far, and they are struggling at various times to make out these icons to the point where they go for different scoring opportunities because they just don't want to look for those icons. On top of that, and this is probably the one that is what gets my goat even more, the symbols on the tiles themselves themselves, and I mean the garden tiles, not the standee ones. These ones are supposed to denote where decorations can go. Now, thematically, they make sense. There's one type of symbol for all the greenery, and that's where all the birds and the trees and that can go. Okay, that makes sense. You know, the water can only have bridges and the fish. Okay, that makes sense. The problem is, these symbols are done in a kind of rhombus square, like slanted square like shape, and they are mostly opaque. They are really light colored which means that again, at a distance, you're gonna to struggle to spot these on the tiles because not every single greenery tile has a greenery symbol on it, for example. So you're constantly having to squint for tiny little icons on the side, opaque symbols on the board, and on top of that even, you've got two types of landscape tokens that you put on the board, but the, the design, the color of the landscape tokens is exactly the same as the color and design of the board itself before you put tiles on, which means that they blend into the board with ridiculous fashion. So you're having to decipher those and the icons and the opaque symbols. Now this is not enough to completely destroy the game experience. The game is still great fun, but these annoyances are big annoyances and the lack of a reference aid just compounds this even more. Why these symbols on the ground tiles could not be like darker? Why could the icons on the landscape tiles not be bigger? It doesn't make sense and these things 
constantly irk you during the game. You'll be going, oh, this is great. I'm making these choices. Oh, hang on a minute. That's the bluey, blue, is that teal? Is that the turquoise character? Okay, he wants those. Where can I see them on these? And you're going to get that quite frequently throughout, despite the fact you'll be enjoying the rest of the game. So now I move on to I for Immersion, which is where I talk about the thematic implications of the game, how well it's integrated, and how immersed you are in the setting itself. Well, here, Tang Garden is relatively abstracted, but because you are building such this beautiful set piece in front of you, it keeps you immersed into this zen-like experience of, you know what, we're just building a nice garden and it looks pretty and I want to be in that garden. There's no like ulterior motive, there's no major player interaction of meanness or anything like that. It's just kind of like Takinoko in the sense that this garden looks nice and I'm doing stuff around it all well and good. Oh yeah, we've also got to win the game by points. It does a decent job of just making it nice, light and fluffy. There is one weird little nitpick I do have to mention though, because a lot of people do, you know, get more offended by this. When you look at the characters in this, in terms of the artwork, there's one thing that crossed my mind the second I looked at these characters. And that phrase was basically, Tilda uh, Swinton, I believe her name is, Tilda Swinton, and maybe I got the surname wrong, from Doctor Strange. Remember the backlash that film got because of the casting choice? Here, this is supposed to be set in the Tang Dynasty, China. Why, from my perspective, maybe I'm wrong, maybe you can tell me otherwise in the comments, but why do these characters look more like Europeans that are dressed up in Asian clothing? They don't look Asian in design. Some of the da people, like the sword dancer and the poet and a few of the others, they look more like someone I would meet down the street that you basically put in Asian cosplay. Why could the drawings have not been made to look more Asian if you're going to set it in that theme? Now for me personally, this isn't a major knock on the game from an enjoyment perspective, but I do have to bring this up because more and more publishers are getting a little bit too, uh, shall we say, lenient on representation when it comes to different cultures. And I feel that this one is going to be another one of those examples where people will bring it up and say, okay, hang on a minute, what gives? So not a major knock on the game from my perspective, but I will bring it up for the benefit of everyone else. And then finally, L for longevity, where I talk about the ultimate replay value of the game. There is a solo mode, and the solo mode is decent enough. It pretty much wipes away half the rules in this game, tweaks a couple others, and gives you a puzzle to solve. You're still building up a garden, but rather than having the competitive nature with the other players, here you essentially have to build the garden using pairs of the stacks. So this pair will be a stack of tiles as well as a decoration card, and you choose a single pair to put on the board. Of course, this problem means that not only do you have to build the garden in its entirety, but you also have to try and build it in such a way that you will score well from characters being placed in decorations, etc., and collecting the cards. The problem is, if you box yourself into a corner, you will just outright lose the game because if the, the combinations are not legal to place, you automatically lose. It's not too difficult to get through the game without automatically losing, but trying to do well and get a high score, which is effectively what you're doing, is a little bit more tougher. It's a decent challenge. It's not the best solo mode ever. I was kind of hoping more for an AI or Tomner like feel, but you know, if you're willing to get this game out and set it up, which takes a little bit of time, the challenge is still there and you can get it done within the 45 minute timer on the box at least. As for the rest of the multiplayer experience, generally the replay value is pretty good. There's multiple paths to victory that you can employ during the game, whether it's your player board, the decorations, specific ways of building the garden, the landscape tiles, focusing on characters. There are different ways that you can play. And as I said before, the garden is dynamic and it will build differently throughout each game, which leads to different ways that the game will evolve. So my final word on Tang Garden is that this is an excellent yet charming tactically based game that light gamers will be able to get into very well. It's beautiful on the table. It looks great. There's multiple paths to victory for you to employ and the decisions, whereas engaging, are not overwhelming either. The constant hindrances towards your experience with the graphic design, having to squint to see various icons, to look around the table to see where the various landscape icons are, all of those things are constantly poking you as you're enjoying this game. So those things do cost this game a seal of distinction, which I 
feel it could have easily obtained, but I still feel it deserves a decent enough 8 out of 10 with a seal of endorsement. This is a game that is fun to play and it looks great. I want to get this game off the shelf and play it again and I think I will hang on to this one in my collection for some time and see how things progress and enjoy the solo mode a bit more. But those Ugh, those graphic design choices are going to hinder it because I know that if I get it off the shelf and play it, I need to be in a place with good lighting, with people who have decent eyesight to get the full enjoyment out of it. Whether it's better on an online setting? That could remain to be seen. It could be better on an online setting on the basis that you can zoom cameras in and see the various icons, but then again, you've still got to mess around with that. It's just the same as you getting your head up close to the image when you're looking at things could have been a good distinction level game. I feel that this could have easily made a 9, possibly even a 10 out of 10 if it really nailed the rule book and the reference aids and the iconography. But it has to be docked a couple of points for it. And so it almost was going to be a 7, but I thought, you know what? The gameplay experience is still worth that 8 out of 10. So that's it for me on this video. Once again, thank you to all my Patreons who helped support this channel and keep it going. As for future content, be sure to subscribe by clicking the watermark in the corner or the big avatar in the middle of the screen. On top of that, if you want to check out more content, you might want to consider my top 10 other YouTube channels where I talk about smaller content creators who need more love. Failing that, you can just click on the most recent episode, which is likely to be one of my podcasts. Take care, and remember, it's only a game.